That's the only bakery I know of. But you need, if you want bread, you need to be at the grocery store by about 10 o'clock. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. Good to see all of you here. And welcome to our international audience, people in Europe, people in South America, people, uh, um, I forget all, everywhere all, they all are, but welcome to all of you. Anyway, uh, today I want to, we've got uh, three more, counting today, three more uh, times that I can talk to you about Passover, getting us prepared for Passover. And I want to make a few announcements, but let's ask God's blessing first. Lord, we thank you for each one who is here. We ask your blessing and anointing on what we're going to be teaching today. And open up the minds of each one today who hears this message to see what you want them to understand about these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I'm not going to talk to you about the coronavirus. Everybody's talking about it on the news. Every time you turn on the TV, that's all you hear. So I'm not going to bore you with it. However, there is one consideration that we have to take a look at, and that is uh, we're going to be having uh, God's Passover which uh, if they see the new moon on the 25th of March, that would make the 26th day one of God's new year. And you count 14 days starting with that. And so April the 8th, which is a Wednesday, would be the Passover day. And that would be the anniversary of the crucifixion of Christ, 1980 some years ago. Now Jesus got together with his disciples on the night before and had the annual Passover uh, service, but he added something brand new that never existed before. He said, now you do this. So when they took Passover the following year, they did what he added to it. Now after the temple was destroyed, they couldn't kill a lamb anymore, but they could still do the communion, which is part of the Passover. Now the Catholic Church, who hated the Jewish people, very strongly anti-Semitic, they took the communion ordinance out of the Passover and started doing it once a year at Easter time. And then eventually they started doing it every every Sunday. but And they called it the Eucharist. So they came up with their own counterfeit of what Jesus actually gave. Jesus did not create some weekly or monthly Eucharist. He created something to be a part of the Passover. Luke 22, verse 15, he said, With desire, I have desired to eat with you this, not Lord's Supper, but not the Eucharist, but the Passover. And so this was part of the Passover. In fact, the, the disciples asked him, where would you that we prepare for you to eat the Passover? And so that night, they were taking, they had a typical uh, Passover dinner, which they had every night. Uh, they killed the lamb actually the next day, and that was when they would have been eating the Passover lamb. But that night, they got together, and he said, take this unleavened bread, this Passover bread. This represents my body. Take the wine. That represents my blood. Now, you do this in remembrance of me. In 1 Corinthians 11, the apostle Paul said, uh, we're to do that till Christ returns. But what the churches of our world don't understand is that's not something you just do anytime you want to. And nowhere does the New Testament say do it as often as you want to. It says when you do it, do it in remembrance of him. And when did the early church do it? Well, I read you only half of the scriptures that Eusebius mentioned. Eusebius, over and over and over in his famous book, he was born in the 200s. Remember that. He was born just a little over 100 years after John had written the book of Revelation. And over and over and over, he talks about Christians celebrating the Passover. That's in his book, Ecclesiastical Church History. All right. Uh, so let me get into the scriptures for you today. Now, let me tell you this. The, 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 the title of this message, if you want a title for it, is should, should, should Gentiles Observe Passover? And for those of you who got the email, how many of you did get the email yesterday? Okay, one person, two you people. We don't, make sure you're on our email list. Everybody in this room is on the email list. I just maybe forgot about Tricia because she had been gone for so long. <coughs> that Excuse year, me. And I didn't add you. I'll add you back to the email list. Uh, yeah, but yes, sir. I don't have a computer, do I? I That's right. If you don't have a computer, you can't get the email. That is true. Don't worry about going out and buying a computer just so you can get emails. Uh, I, I don't even know how to run. Yeah, don't feel bad. Um, I used to say I didn't know how to work a computer except to plug it in. But anyway, on the email that you that those of you who did get it yesterday, I mentioned the fact that, that this week I had gotten a letter at, via email from uh, 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 somebody who knows that I teach on the holy days and I observe the holy days and she had a question and her question and I'm just going to pair well you saw the email so you know what she said but for those of you who did not get the email basically she wants to know is it right for us to go backward 
and start keeping the Sabbath and all that. Aren't we going backward? Aren't we? Shouldn't we be going forward? Because if we go back, as she put it, to, to observing these things, aren't we putting ourselves under the law? Now, it's amazing to me that you're going forward if you keep the first day of the week, but you're going backward if you keep the same day Jesus kept. How's that going backward? Unless, of course, you look at Jude verse 3 where it says, let's go back to the faith once delivered. Now, that's a good way to go backward. The faith once delivered by the apostles. Absolutely. In Exodus 12, 14, I'm not going to turn there. Not yet I won't, but I want you to turn with me to Romans 2. And while you're turning to Romans 2, I want to tell you that in Exodus it says the Passover was ordained forever. So even when the new covenant is set up at the second coming of Christ, and we're under the terms of it now, even then, it's still going to be going on. Now, should Gentiles be observing it? Now, this is the last day. I'm going to be really nailing this thing down to answer the question that, that even a lot of our graduates still have. 90% of our graduates are still wondering, well, should we be doing these things? If they weren't still wondering, we couldn't put them all in this room because they still don't think they should do it. So today, I want to prove this once and for all that Gentiles, and I'm a Gentile, should observe the same laws that God gave to Israel. So there will never, ever again be a doubt in your mind whether or not you should obey God. Well, I'm a Gentile. I don't have to obey God. That's what people say. Well, if I'm not going to obey God, let me start with the seventh commandment. Let me break that one first. You ought to see my neighbor's wife across the street. I'm joking, but, but you know what I'm saying. If you're, going to, if you're not going to keep God's law... Don't just not keep Passover. Don't even bother with the Ten Commandments. You see, it's stupid. It's crazy. Anytime a man tells me why God did away with the Ten Commandments, I say, can I meet your wife? What? Those are fighting words. It brings the point home, though. Say, wait, wait a minute. You can't do that. Yes, I can. Romans 4.15, if there's no law, there's no, there's no transgression. Now, in uh, Romans chapter 2, I want to read to you something here. And we're going we're gonna to nail this thing down. Now, next week and the following week will be our last two weeks before Passover. Uh, and I'm going to get more into the New Testament. But today we're going we're gonna to tackle this. I prayed about it, and I feel like this is what I should, should give you today. But what I was going to say about communion uh, based on the coronavirus, which I don't want to get into, because we could talk about that all morning, and everybody's talking about it. But it may be that legally uh, we won't be able to have graduation we may not be uh, even able to have communion in, what, three weeks from now? Two weeks from now. We may not be able uh, to have it. Two and a half weeks, actually. We may not be able to. So, <clears throat> yeah, we could break the law, but I don't want to do that. Uh, not just because it's a law, but because we are concerned about people's health. Now, right now, we can have 10 people easily. In fact, we're allowed to have 50. So we could have communion. But we'll see as time goes by. Now, if we don't have our Passover communion service on April the 7th on that night, what I'll probably do is, is let ask you to take it home, which you can do. Uh, the foot washing part would, would be out, but you could do the bread and the wine at home. I've done it at home when I had to, when I've been alone. Uh, when I first moved back to North Carolina from Texas some years ago, I had a little prayer altar out in the woods. I took the bread and the wine and went out to the little prayer altar right after sundown. And got on my knees before God, and I said, I'm, you know, doing this to honor Jesus Christ. And I took it alone. And I'm sure that God must have honored that because I was doing the best I could. And thankfully, over the last 16 years, we've had people here that we can all get together and do it the way Christ intended for us to do it. You know, Jesus had a small group. He washed the feet of 12 people. So there were 13 of them, at least, in that room. Well, we have it. We have more than that to come here every year. Do we have a question on that? I would just want to make a comment. Okay. Um, if we end up having to cancel Passover, what we can do is just live stream you going through the scriptures and yeah. get, and you and right. do your message because we live stream it anyway. <clears throat> we don't take questions or anything. We just yeah. live stream you going through the scriptures and giving yeah. the little sermonettes right. that you give between each thing. That's right. So we could do yeah. that that way. That way, Anybody people around the world could also take it at the same right, time. Right. That way. Because we, we do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But this way, if we have to cancel it, then everybody that wanted yeah. to come could do that. Yeah. And it's done just in case. Yeah. So we, we will probably, I will probably at least be live streaming it. Yeah. And I'll probably be here. If one or two of you show up here, that's fine too. Right. We just can't go over the people limit. Because yeah. we've had years yeah. where we've had 40 people. We've had 40 here? Yes. Okay, so. 
Yeah, so so I'll probably be here to live stream it. For those of you who want to stay home, be sure to watch it. And for those of you in different parts of the world, make sure it's after sundown, the beginning of the 14th of the month of Aviv. Don't just do it when we're doing it here because it might not be the 14th where you are. So it's after sundown at the beginning of the 14th. And I'll maybe get, I've already talked about that so much, I probably don't need to get into that anymore. And we're in the Eastern time zone too. Yeah, that's, uh, it'll be 8 o'clock Eastern time zone here. Now, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 13, For not the hearers of the law, and all of you have heard the law, I know you have because if you've come here, you've heard me teach it. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law. Now, wait a minute. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to Jews. No, no. He's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to Romans. Look at the top of the page. It says Romans. Not Hebrews. Romans. The Romans were Italians. Italians asked them, well, next time you meet an Italian, are you Jewish? He may slap you if he, if he doesn't like Jews. But, um, and it's amazing how much anti-Semitism there is in the world because God's chosen people are hated by the devil. Therefore, the devil's people hates the Jews. Think about that. So if you hate the Jews, you better check just who do you belong to, God or the devil? Because God loves them. And it says here, he's writing to these Italians in Rome. He says, the doers of the law. But wait a minute. Look at the date at the top of the page. In my reference Bible, it says A.D. 60. It might have been 59. It could have been 61. But right around A.D. 60, which means it was right around 30 years after the cross. If the law had been done away, isn't it amazing that within the last 30 years, nobody told Paul, nobody even mentioned it to Paul. No one said a word to him about it. He didn't know the law was done away. Isn't that amazing? Now, you know it, and I know it because we grew up in Protestant churches. But Paul didn't know it was done away. Isn't that amazing? I'm being facetious in case you don't know. And for those of you who don't know me over the Internet, I am being totally facetious. I'm being sarcastic. Of course Paul knew the truth. And so the law was still in existence. He says here, the doers of the law, the law had to exist. The doers of the law are the ones that will be just before God. Verse 21, you therefore who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You that preach a man should not steal. That's number eight of the Ten Commandments. Do you steal? He's implying you should not, which implies you ought to obey God. You that say that a man should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You, that's number seven. You that abhor idols, that's commandment number two. Do you commit sacrilege? Now, verse 23, the translators put a question mark at the end of that verse. There's, there's no question mark in the Greek. It's actually a statement. It's not a question. You who make your boast of the law through breaking the law, you're dishonoring God. He's not asking them. He's telling them. He's telling them, you're dishonoring God. If you break the law, who's he talking to? Gentiles. If you break the law, you're dishonoring God. So the law had to still exist. Now in, let's see, verse um, 24, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. And uh, he says, circumcision verily profits if you keep the law, because the Jews were very pri prideful of that token in their flesh. But Paul says circumcision doesn't do a Jew any good if he doesn't keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, keep the righteousness of the law, that's good. That's counted for circumcision. Now, verse 27, and shall not uncircumcision the Gentiles, which is by nature, that's how a man is born, if it fulfill the law, you judge. If it fulfills the law, that's what counts. If that uncircumcised Gentile keeps God's law, it doesn't matter whether he's circumcised or not. Now, verses 28 and 29 are really the verses I wanted to come to because he's writing to Gentiles. Now, I'm a Gentile. He's writing to me. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. All right, here's a racial, ethnic Jew. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. That's not what God is looking at. But he is a Jew. Listen to me, all you Gentiles. He is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision of the heart in the spirit, whose praise is not of men but of God. You can't take the praise. All right, I'm a Jew. Give me some praise here because I'm a Jew. I was born one of the chosen people. He said, no, the praise has to be of God. Now, I'm a Gentile. I'm not one of the chosen people, but I've been born again. And now I'm among 
I'm among the Jews now. I am a Jew inwardly, not outwardly. Everybody in this room, if you're converted, if you have the Holy Spirit, you are Jewish. Did you know that? Now, if that insults you, you need to get your heart right with God. I'm not insulted. In fact, wouldn't it have been something if you and I had been in heaven before God let us be born? And what if we had gone up to God and said, I'm ready to be born now? And God said, okay, now what, what country do you want to be born in? You would have probably picked America. Then if he just said, now, now what race do you want to be? I want to be an Israelite. What tribe? I want to be a Jew. I mean, everybody wants want to be the same tribe Jesus is. But we didn't get that opportunity. I'm German. I'm as, I belong to the meanest race in the world. <laughs> the Germans are a mean people. And that's not a racist statement. I am German. I can say that. Now, you get them saved, they're all right. But when they're not saved, woo, watch out for those Germans. World War III will probably, it'll probably be started by Germany again. They are mean people. So I'm a Gentile. How many of you are German in here, by the way? Yeah, y'all are really mean. <laughs> <laughs> but no, when you get converted, <laughs> the, the, the spirit of Christ comes into you, and you have the fruits of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and patience and goodness and gentleness, of which there's no law against that. So you and I have been changed. But here's the thing. We are inward Jews. Why would a Gentile say, I don't have to keep Passover because... I'm not Jewish. Hold on. You're telling me you're not saved. Galatians 3, 28, 29 says, if you belong to Christ, you're now Abraham's seed. All right now, I want us to take a look at Exodus, and I'd like for you to go back there with me to Exodus 12. Now, don't say, well, I've heard all this before. Listen, every year at Passover, God wants us to hear it again. Do you know that this week in Israel, parents are sitting down with their children and they're telling them about Passover. And little kids are saying, what's Passover? They never, little kids never heard of it. Well, Passover is when our ancestors came out of Egypt. And every year they explain this to their children about what Passover is all about and how their ancestors were slaves in Egypt. And God delivered them through these miraculous things. I don't know that they watch Cecil B. DeMille's movie. I don't know about that, but Christians do. Exodus 12, verse 14. This day, the first day of Passover week, which is the 15th of the month of Abib, shall be to you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord. Not a Jewish feast, a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now, I know people say forever doesn't mean forever, but actually when you do a thorough study of the word forever, you'll find out, Yes, it does, actually. I won't go into that right now. I've done it in the past. Now, people say, okay, I agree with you. This is what a lot of people that I know would say. It is ordained forever, but it's only for the Jewish people. It's not for me because I'm Gentile. Well, then you need to get saved, and then you'd be a Jew. Oh, no, it just means the ethnic Jews. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Let's prove all things by the Bible. Now, let's take a look at uh, verse 26. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say, What do you mean by this service? What is this thing called Passover? That you shall say is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. You're going to tell your kids what this is all about. That's what God wants the people to do. Now, you say, but I'm a Gentile. That doesn't apply to me. All right, ethnically, your ancestors did not come out of Egypt. That's true. As far as being slaves amongst Israel. But when we get grafted into the family, we are now a part of Abraham's children. So what's wrong with us talking about what our brethren, because now we're brothers to the Jewish people, what they went through in Egypt. We should talk about it. We should explain it. And then, of course, to the Christian, Passover is more than they came out of Egypt. To the Christian, Passover is the day when our Savior died for us. We have more to talk about, about the Passover, than the Jews do. Bless their hearts when their children, this time of the year, in Israel, ask them, Mom and Dad, what's this Passover all about? Oh, it's uh, when we came out of Egypt. You and I can say, when our children ask us, what's Passover about? It's about our Lord and Savior who was God Almighty, who created their universe, became a man, and, and came here so he could die for my sins and for your sins. The Passover now has a thousand times 
greater meaning to the Christian than it ever did to the Jew. Oh, it's wonderful. They open up the Red Sea. That's, I've seen that movie over and over. Oh, it's wonderful. But what we have is more wonderful. We're not here to talk about Israel coming out of Egypt. We're talking about Passover because Almighty God became flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. The God of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And he's the one. That, and we talked about this Wednesday night in our physics, our astrophysics class, where I was showing pictures here uh, of the universe, of all these various galaxies and everything. Jesus Christ made all those billions and billions and billions of galaxies, and he gave up all that power and all that glory to become a human being to come down here and talk to us personally. And the human race killed him. But he let it happen. And he died in our place. That is such a beautiful, beautiful message. The Bible has a name for it. Gospel. That's the gospel. That's the, the Greek word means good message. The good message is God loves you so much he was willing to give his life for you. That's the gospel. So we have a lot more to talk about than the Jews ever did. Now I want you to notice here also in chapter 12 and verse 38. Well, verse 37, it says there were uh, 600,000 men beside children that went out of Egypt. But now, verse 38, I want you to pay attention to. And a mixed multitude, not Israelites, Gentiles, went up also with them. Now, let me tell you about this multitude. First of all, if they weren't Israelites, they had, there had to be a bunch of Egyptians amongst them. But what a lot of people don't know is this. Egypt was the breadbasket of... Um, of the world. It was the most economically powerful nation. It was the most militarily powerful nation. Egypt was like America today, except probably more powerful uh, in respect to the other nations. Now, we know for a fact, according to historians, that Egypt at this time had commerce, had trade with Greece. In Moses' day, they had commerce. So there were a lot of Greeks in Egypt. Now, I used to live near Washington, D.C. I, I, I owned a home just 45 minutes from the White House, and any time I just want to drive up there and drive around, I could. It was really nice to be able to do that. And I remember driving down a road one day. I forget the name of the street, but over here's the Korean embassy, and over there's the Japanese embassy, and here's the Russian embassy, and here's the Chinese embassy. What do you have in Washington, D.C.? People from all nations. And that's how Egypt was. If you had lived in Moses' day, you would have met people, certainly from Greece, You'd have met people from Ethiopia. You'd have met certainly a lot of Africans. You'd have met uh, probably Asiatics. Have you ever noticed some of the very, very ancient statues and, and paintings of the Egyptians way back in Moses' day? Their eyes were slanted like that. It makes you wonder, do they have Asiatics trading with them also? Were there Asians there? You get the impression that just like in Washington, D.C., all nations are represented in Washington, D.C., it's very possible that all nations were represented in this mixed multitude. That not only did Israel come out of Egypt, but you had Asians, you had certainly had Greeks, you had Africans. You had a mixed multitude of what? Gentiles who came out of Egypt with Israel. Now, verse 49 tells us this. God's already considering the fact that all these Gentiles have come out in order to serve the one true God. Now, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, how many of you are serving the one true God? You'd all raise your hands, right? Listen to what God says. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, because he's they're, they're going to the promised land, and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. God didn't say, now I want the Israelites to keep the Sabbath, but now you Gentiles, you Africans, you Greeks, you got to keep Sunday. No, no, one law. One law was for them. And so when God gave the Passover, he didn't give it just to Israel. And I've heard people over and over say, God only gave the Sabbath to the Jews. No, he gave it to all this mixed multitude. When God gave the Ten Commandments, he gave it to Africans, Egyptians, Greeks, and maybe some Asians were also there. Let's go to Leviticus 24. The next book over. Now, I know most of you have heard this, but... I want to really zero in on it today and maybe add a little more information, give us some enlightenment. Chapter 24 and verse 16. He that blasphemes the name of the Lord, and this was an Egyptian kid that did this. This was an Egyptian who blasphemed. He wasn't an Israelite. Did he have to obey the same law? 
Verse 16, he that blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and everybody's going to stone him. As well the stranger as he that's born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, the stranger or the Israelite, he'll be put to death. Same law. Verse 22, you shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as one of your own country. Okay, I'm not Jewish. Do I have to keep Passover? I'm not Jewish. Should I keep God's Sabbath days? Well, according to the Bible, yes, you should. Let's go to Numbers chapter 9. And, of course, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. When did God change his mind? People say, when Christ came, he changed his mind. Jesus said, don't think I've come to destroy the law. Oh, well, then it must have been during the uh, lifetime of the apostles. Paul said, do we make void the law? We, we apostles? God forbid. We established the law. Well, then who abolished it? The Catholic Church did. Did they have the right? Numbers 9 and verse 14. If a stranger shall show a sojourn among you, now if they're living in China, you can't do anything about it. If they're living in Japan, but if they're with you, they want to serve the true God, and they want to keep the Passover according to the ordinance of the Passover and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. Now listen to the last part. You shall have one ordinance both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. So when people say, Keith Slough, you keep Passover? You're not Jewish. No, I'm not, except spiritually. I've been grafted in. But you see, the laws that God gave Israel, I am required to obey. Now, I've heard people say, but we're not under the law, we're under grace. Oh, well, you're talking about salvation. Amen, brother. We're not even under the two commandments of Jesus. I don't have to love God with all my heart. I don't have to love my neighbor as myself, and that includes you. <laughs> that's what I would tell the guy. But that's for salvation. But now, once I'm already saved by grace, now is when I start reading the Ten Commandments and saying, okay, I'm going to keep this one and this one and this one, and I'm going to ask God to help me to keep these. I'm going to start loving my neighbor. I'm going to start loving God with all my heart. Once you get converted, that's when you start obeying God. That's when you start tithing for, for most of us is once we're converted. That's when we start reading our Bible and studying to show ourselves approved unto God. Now look at chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15 and verse 15. Uh, one ordinance shall be for both of you of the congregation, an Israelite, and also for the stranger, an ordinance forever in your generations. Here's the ordinance that God made. As you are, Israel, so shall the stranger be for the, before the Lord. I'm the stranger, I'm the Gentile, I'm a stranger to Israel, and so are you who are not Israelites. Most of us here are not Israelites. Most of us in this room are Gentiles. So God said, now the same law I gave the Jews... I, I require you to keep. And you have a choice. Yes, Lord. Or no, Lord, I won't do that. Jesus, who was the God of the Old Testament, said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you won't do the things which I say. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord? You won't do what I tell you to do. What did you tell me to do? Well, go back to the Old Testament. Oh, but Lord, that's Old Testament. And the Lord says, Man shall not live by bread only. But by every word of God, there's not one member of any church out here, I think, that you could ever ask him, is the Old Testament the word of God, that he had to say, no, it's not. They all agree it's the word of God. The Catholics say, well, yeah, the Old Testament's the word of God. Well, if that's the word of God, how come you don't keep it? Well, that's Old Testament. Jesus said, live by all of it. Paul said to Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures since you were a child. Well, he certainly didn't know first or second Timothy hadn't been written yet what were the scriptures Timothy knew the Old Testament he said and, and all scripture and the only scripture they had canonized was the Old Testament he said all of it's profitable for doctrine you mean the book of Exodus is profitable for doctrine yeah Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles verse 16 one law and one manner shall be for you and for the stranger so Gentiles are supposed to keep it as well now I want to go to Deuteronomy Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Are there any questions at this point? For most of us, this is kind of a review, but I hope I'll be able to enlighten you with a few new thoughts. Chapter 31 and verse 11. When all Israel shall come to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. 
Gather the people together, men, women, and children, and uh, don't forget the stranger. Wait a minute, I don't have to do that. I'm Gentile. I can stay home. No, no, no. Gather the stranger that's within your gates, that, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and listen, you strangers to, the, to Israel, you Gentiles, and observe to do all the words of this law. Gentiles are required to observe all the words of this law. That includes Passover. That's why we're going to keep Passover. Gather the people together, men, women, and children, and also the stranger, that they may all do the words of this law. How about that? And observe to do all the words of this law. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Remember when they came into the land. This is 40 years later, remember. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. And in chapter 1 of Deuteronomy and verse 1, these are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel on this side of the Jordan. They were still on the eastern side of Jordan. Verse 2, there were 11 days' journey from Horeb, that's at Mount Sinai. And it came to pass, verse 3, in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to all of them according to all that God had told him. Now in chapter 4, in verse 2. So now we know the time period. Now look at chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, but neither shall you diminish all from it. Okay, I'll keep the Ten Commandments, but I'm not going to keep those statutes. Why not? I don't want to. Well, that's carnality. You shall not add, but neither are you to diminish or subtract from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. You're not keeping them if you take away from them. Well, I only took one out. I took number four. I didn't like the fourth commandment. If you take one out, then you're not obeying God. Chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, this might be new to some of you. Verse 1, Moses called all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak. Now, statutes and judgments, these are the laws of God, which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them, keep them, and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. That was 40 years ago, Horeb, Mount Sinai. But now, listen to this, the Lord made not this covenant, the Sinai covenant, with our fathers. Now, the Bible definition of the fathers is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God didn't make this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But with us, even us who are alive here this day. And then the rest of chapter 5, God goes through the Ten Commandments and explains them. Chapter 6, God go, does it through Moses. God is teaching them again, the next generation. Chapter 6, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded you to teach you. Now, here's what I want to show you that's maybe something you haven't thought about. Look at chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. You mean he's making another covenant? This is a new covenant besides the one at Mount Sinai. But now, wait a minute. We've already been reading way ahead in Deuteronomy where God said keep all these commandments. So this new covenant was made with the new generation 40 years later. This new covenant, it's really based on the same laws, the commandments, the statutes, and judgments. The only difference is it's made with a new generation. Remember Hezekiah made a covenant with all of Judah to serve God? You can make covenants over and over and over if you want to. Let's see here. All right, so he said he's making a covenant that's different from the one they made at Mount Sinai. Verse 2, Moses called all Israel and said, You've seen all that the Lord did before your eyes, and so on. So what is this new covenant? It has the exact same laws as the old one. Look at verse 9. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them. What are those words? Look at verse 13. That he may establish you today for a people to himself, that he may be a God to you as he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That tells you who the fathers are. Neither with you only do I make this covenant, this oath, verse 15, but with him that stands here with this day before the Lord our God. Neither with him that stands here this day, but also with him that is not here. Our generations that's this yet future. And it's not just with the descendants of Israel, it's with those Gentiles that were among them. 
chapter 32 now of Deuteronomy, verse 46. I'm giving you a lot of scripture because in a typical uh, sermon, they give you one scripture, one passage, and lay your Bible down, and then they quote from anecdotes and stuff like that. I don't do that. I want you to hear what God has to say, and that's why it requires going through a lot of scripture. In verse 46, chapter 32, verse 46, he said to them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify you among this day. Now notice he's making a new covenant with them, but notice this, which you shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. The law is still in this covenant just like it was with what we call the old covenant. It's the same thing. And in the new covenant, God has the same laws in the new covenant. Verse 47, it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. <coughs> Without faith you cannot please God. And every year when I start the faith and healing class, I tell our students, and those of you who are graduates can, can verify this. I tell them, don't just study this faith thing to, to pass the test and get a degree. What you're le learning in the faith class could be a matter of life and death to you or to your loved ones. There are people that I've prayed for and taught them faith on their deathbed, and I've seen God heal them. I've seen people heal various ones of cancer, of incurable cancer. We had a guy that came right here to this building, and he had stage four cancer. He had, I think, like a month to live or something like that. In a very short time, he had to live. He was an atheist. But now that he's dying, he wants prayer. Go figure. And I didn't know he was going to be there. And several of the people brought him up here and said, Keith, would you pray for so-and-so here? He's, he's got stage four cancer. And I knew about him. I think I had met him one time. But he was kind of arguing with some of our, our students because he didn't believe in God. Well, when he found out he had stage four cancer, he went to those students and, and said, help me. And they could have prayed for him because they'd been through the faith class, but they said, let's, let's get you to church. So they brought him here to this very building. And I said, do you want to be healed? Yeah. I said, let's get you a chair. And I put a chair right here. And I preached to him. I didn't preach to him. I'd be rude. But I mean, I gave him the scriptures. And I went through the faith scriptures with him. I said, now when I lay hands on you, God's going to heal you. And I think, if I remember correctly, I had other people to gather around. Some of you might have been there. We gathered around and laid hands on him. God totally, completely healed him. Cancer was gone out of his body. That was in March of that year. And in April, he came and got baptized. Yes, sir. I was just wondering where he was now. Um, I lost contact after that. I lost contact with a lot of the people. I need, in fact, there was one fellow I've told y'all in the faith class about this fellow that was paralyzed and had a year to live, and God healed him right that very night. And he got up and started running around the hospital. I just talked to him a few weeks ago. He's still doing fine. He's still alive. He was only had a year to live then. So I've seen God do this. So why do I have a faith class? Because here's the thing. As, as it says right here, it is not a vain thing for you to keep God's law, for it is your life. What you learn in the faith class could save your life. Keeping God's commandments could save your life. What about the laws of clean and unclean? If you don't want to get sick, don't eat unclean animals. And when this coronavirus is going around, your body may not be as strong as it would be, and you could catch the virus and die simply because you're disobeying God. Do you know that when the plague hit Europe back in the Middle Ages and it killed, what, millions of Europeans, about wiped out Europe, you know who didn't get sick? Yeah, bubonic plague. You know who did not get sick? The Jewish people didn't get sick. They couldn't find one Jew among them. Now, the Catholics weren't smart enough to say, what are they doing that we could do? What are they doing that we could imitate so we don't get sick? That's what they should have done. Instead, they said, well, since they're not getting sick, they must have brought a curse on us, so let's kill the Jews. So that gave them an excuse to go out and kill the Jews. Yet, let me tell you what the Jews were doing. They weren't eating the rats. They weren't eating the, the unclean animals. They weren't eating the swine's flesh. They were obeying God's laws. So when the plague was killing millions of Gentiles all around him, the Jews were doing just fine. God's law could mean a matter of life and death for you. Don't just learn these laws so you can pass a test and get a degree and say, oh, look, I got a degree. I'm going to hang it up here on the wall. Isn't that nice? Isn't that pretty? Decorates my wall. If you don't obey God, you could die with that degree hanging on your wall. God's, these laws are not a bunch of dumb rituals. God had a reason for saying don't eat swine's flesh, don't eat lobster, don't eat shellfish, which is highly allergenic. 
I mean, God said, don't eat this because it's for your health. It's your life. But I've preached that to people for all these years on radio. And how many people even pay attention? Yeah, that's just your opinion. Okay, if it's my opinion, I'm not going to die like you are from these horrible diseases because I'm obeying God. You say, Keith, you shouldn't say that. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, if you say something, you believe in your heart, you'll have what you say. So guess what? Not only am I obeying God, which allows me to have this kind of faith, but I'm saying it, I'm declaring it. Job 22, 28, you shall decree a thing and you'll be established in it. Now you think about that. This is a matter of life and death. Folks, over 200 people have already died in the United States from this coronavirus. There's, I don't know how many, I think it's over 100 people in North Carolina that now has it. It's more than that because I, I, I got a thing today that said 97 just in Mecklenburg County. 97 just in Mecklenburg County. So no, what, 77. what you're learning in these services and what you have learned in class could save your life. Yes, sir. There's already 10,000 killed all over the world. All over the world? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a bunch, thousands. And this is just the beginning. Somebody has, a, I've had, I think, numerous ones to ask me, what do I think about this coronavirus? First of all, it's not the tribulation, but... Thursday night, I had some slides, and I showed these slides of all the empty shelves in the stores. I've never in my life ever seen it that way. My parents never saw it that way. Even in the Great Depression, I don't think they had that. But, folks, that's only a foretaste of the Great Tribulation. What's it going to be like when you walk into a grocery store once the Tribulation comes with a wad of cash, and there's nothing to buy with it? There's no bread. There's no eggs. There's no nothing. I went to buy eggs. Uh, last, last night. Yeah, but last week I did, too. Okay. Or th Tuesday night, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I forget. Anyway, I went to buy eggs. There were no e uh, there were not eggs, but bread. There was no bread. There were no eggs. And again, last night, or Thursday night, no eggs, no bread. And I asked the guy who worked down there, I said, when are you going to get another shipment of bread? And he said, we don't know. Folks, this is nothing compared to the tribulation. The tribulation is going to be the worst time in all of history. What we are seeing now is a foretaste to help us to prepare. And the way you prepare is not just by stockpiling your... Your, uh, your basement with potatoes, but get right and become a Philadelphia Christian. Who else? Don't, don't, yeah. don't you think that God is trying to teach us a lesson through this? God is going to get our attention. Amen. If we're smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and all that's my introduction. I think I'm ready to start with my message now. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so um, verse 47 is not a vain thing. Now, chapter 33 and verse 7 says, and this is the blessing of Judah. Hear the voice of, hear, Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him to his people. What is this? This is a, a blessing on each one of the tribes of Israel. Verse 6, let Reuben, Reuben, he was the oldest one, let him live. Now, verse 8, and of Levi, he said. Now, this is another thing he said about Levi as he's giving a blessing on all the tribes. Verse 10, they shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. So, so the Levites were to teach God's law, even under this new covenant that he established with this new generation. <coughs> Deuteronomy 14 talks about unclean animals. That was reiterated. Now I want you to go with me to chapter 16 and verse 1. Observe the month of Abib. Now, the word month there, Kodesh, means new moon. On the 25th, which should be a, uh, a Wednesday night, go out at, at sundown, right after sundown, and look in the west about 15, 20 minutes after sundown, and you should see this little tiny new crescent. And if it's after sundown, that means the following day is day one uh, of the month. And so do what it says. Observe the new moon of Abib. Abib means green ears in the springtime. And I'm going to be doing that. In fact, we have a class that night, and we're, I'm going to take the whole class out there to the north parking lot. We're going to look over there in the west and observe the new moon of Abib. And keep the Passover to the Lord. All right? He said do that. Now in verse, uh, thir let's see, verse 9, seven weeks are to number from that time, from the Passover. And that's, you start with the wave sheaf. Now verse 16, three times, well, wait a minute, verse 13, then you observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Those were your three times, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. Verse 16, three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God. And Deuteronomy 12 and also Deuteronomy 14 says bring the women too if you can. 
And then he tells you those three times, the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, and then the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, and then, of course, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the autumn. Now, we're not doing that in this country, that you and I can do it. But so many people say, well, my churches, they're full of Christians, and they don't do that, so why should I do it? You're welcome to follow men if you want to, or you can follow the Word of God. Don't follow religion. Follow the Word of God. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, it shall come to pass if you'll do hearken diligently to the voice of God to observe to do all his commandments, except for the fourth one. Oh, and except for the second one. And except for the seventh one, if you just happen to have a next-door next neighbor who looks pretty good. Oh, and it's okay to still lie once. No, no. All these commandments, if you do them all, here's what's going to happen. Verse 2, you'll get all these blessings. They will overtake you. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Verse 11, you'll be plenteous in goods. Now, verse 15, but it shall come to pass if you will not hearken to his voice to do all his commandments. Don't pick and choose. Verse 16, cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the field. Verse 21, the, now listen to this. The Lord shall make the pestilence, the plague, this coronavirus that's killing thousands. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave to you. Verse 15, if you don't obey God's commandments. With a fever, that's verse 22. Are you getting this? And with an inflammation, and so on and so on. Pestilence is the result of our nation and our the, the nations of the world not obeying God. If you notice, there's a whole lot more curses. There are more curses there because, are. yeah. And I'm, I, I've said this for years, and I'm still saying it. America right now is under the judgment of God. Is that because of the breaking of covenants? Well, that part, partly. I mean, we're just simply, we've thrown God out of our educational system. Yes. It's against the law to pray to God. It's turned wicked. It's turned wicked. The ACLU is right at the, it's the catalyst of all this mess. Uh -huh. And they're mostly Jewish lawyers who hate Christianity. It's, it is a shame. Verse 29, you shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness. Listen to this, and you shall not prosper in your ways. What is happening now is going to hurt our economy. We had a booming economy. This comes along, and it could wreck our economy. Stores having to close. It's going to affect our economy. God said you're not going to prosper. That You'll have pestilence that will cleave to you that you don't know how to get rid of, and you're not going to prosper. You're going to go into poverty. Folks, this is because of our sin. Now, I'm going to ask you, don't answer out loud, but is it possible that maybe we're living in the last days? Yeah. Verse 45, moreover, all these curses shall come upon you. They'll pursue you. They'll overtake you till you be destroyed. Here's why. Because you hearken not to the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes. Oh, but that's only for the Jews. Wait a minute. If that's only for, for the Jews, why is the coronavirus in America? Why is it in Italy? They're, they're Gentiles, all Gentiles. Why is the coronavirus in Iran? They're Gentiles because God wants all nations, represented by that mixed multitude, to keep his law. And you know who's fighting it more than anybody? Not the atheists. Not the agnostics. The churches. The churches. Oh, we don't have to keep God's law. One minister on television says the Christian has no relationship to the Ten Commandments. That's all done away. That's all abolished. And it's no wonder we're having all these problems. Give me just 10 more minutes here before you leave. There's some comments whenever you get at the end. Oh, yeah, at the end, yeah. They can wait till the end. Now, in, in, let's see, verse 47, let me read that. Because you didn't serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. This country... None of us have ever gone hungry. You get hungry at lunchtime and then you go eat, don't you? Plenty of food. Restaurants everywhere. Nobody goes hungry. Nobody starves. If they got just a little bit of money, you're going to get a hamburger or a pizza or something. We have the abundance of all things. But notice it says you didn't serve God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart. A lot of Christians don't even pray to thank God for the fact they got food. When people in other nations are starving and we've got a plate full of food. Well, even now, you know, people are hoarding food so much today yeah. mm -hmm. that 
some people can't get anything that they, especially older people or yeah. people that don't have money to hoard. Yeah. When they go to the store just to get their regular groceries to feed their family, there's nothing there. I could say prophetically, this is the beginning of sorrows. It's not the end. It's the beginning. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, about the new covenant says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, I'll make a new covenant. And here's another new covenant with house, the house of Israel and with Judah. And that happens when Christ returns to the second coming. If you read all the scriptures, which I don't have time to read. And verse 33, he says, here's the covenant that I'll make. He didn't say, I will get rid of my law. He said, I'll put my law in their inward parts. I'll write it in their hearts. How is it that Gentile Christians say, oh, that's not for us? When the Bible says under the new, if you're under the new covenant, the law is supposed to be in your heart so that you can obey it. God didn't put it in your heart so you could ignore it. Now, in Ezekiel, the next book over, and I'm out of time just about here, but let me read to you just a few scriptures here. In chapter 34, verse 11, it shows that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter here. That's a good verse, though. Uh, chapter 34, that's a good scripture, though. God doesn't want us to die, he wants us to repent. I do ask for inspiration. Verse uh, Verse uh, 11 of chapter 34, thus says the Lord, I will search for my sheep and seek them out. And all those Israelites who have been scattered around the world are coming back into the land. And then chapters 35 and 36 talks about how that after Christ returns, because he gathers them together after he returns. How do I know that? Because in chapter 34, verse 23, God said, I'll set up one shepherd over them. He'll, sh he'll feed them. Who? My servant, David. Well, David's been dead 500 years by the time Ezekiel wrote this. David is still dead, according to the book of Acts. This is at the resurrection of the dead. David has been resurrected by this time, which means Jesus has come back. Because the, the dead don't get resurrected until Christ returns. So David is now ruling over the, all the tribes of Israel that come back into the land. Chapters 35 and 36 talk about how God is going to punish the Arabs because of their perpetual hatred against the Jews. That's chapter 35 and verse 5. And then verse, chapters 36 and 37 deal with the restoration, how it's going to come about. And verse uh, chapter 37, verse 22, there will no more be Israel and Jew. They're all going to be one nation. Chapters 38 and 39 talk about the Russian invasion. And then in chapter 40, in my reference Bible, it says, the general theme of these nine chapters are Israel in the land during the kingdom age. There's going to be a millennial temple set up. And then if you read all these last nine chapters, they're going to be offering up sacrifices even in the millennium because not a jot or tittle of God's law has passed away. In chapter 43 and verse 2, the glory of the God of Israel. Who is the God of Israel? Jesus Christ came from the way of the east. He's coming into, from the east, uh, from the west to the east, it says in Matthew 24. And his voice was like the noise of many waters. The earth shined with his glory. That didn't happen the first coming. And verse 7, Jesus says, Son of man, talking to Ezekiel, here's the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell with the children of Israel forever. And then verse 9, the last line says, I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Chapter 44 of Ezekiel. And verse 23, in the millennium, now listen to this, God will set up his ministers who shall, verse Verse 23, the third line, he, they will cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. So they won't be allowed to eat unclean meats in the millennium. Verse 24, they shall keep my laws and my statutes and they shall hallow my Sabbaths for a thousand years. Not just Israel, but all nations are going to do that. All right, all right let's go ahead and take those comments real quickly if, there's, if I can answer them real quickly. Um. Somebody wanted to know if we would put something together on how to take Passover at home by yourself. Yeah, I've got something on how to take Passover at home. If you'll send it to me, I can email it out to our group. But somebody else wanted me to post it on the church Facebook. Okay. So that way, if you send it everybody to me, will have it then. everybody will have it on the church Facebook. But okay. I can also email it okay. out to the group because not everybody has Facebook. Were there any other comments? Yes. Also, somebody is asking... If um, we would be willing to um, send anointed cloths, like for because of the, let me read the comment all together. Oh yes, yeah. so I will be willing to send out anointed cloths. If they will contact me with my my email, and 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 if you if you're I'll, sick or whatever, 
I do pray over those claws. I send them out, and according to Acts chapter 19, people will be healed. I send them mine and your email address. That way they okay. can email us both, and we'll make sure we don't miss anything. Okay. Um, so those are the two comments, but I also wanted to add about the live streaming for Passover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're in a different time zone than us, if you... Um, if it's before us, then mm -hmm. there's not a lot we can do about that. But if your time zone is after hours, then after eight o'clock our time, after eight o'clock our mm -hmm. time, then you can still the video. It'll be archived. It'll be archived. The live yeah. stream will be archived, and you can go back and watch the service. That's right. And do yeah. your at home. That's right. Time. For people, for those of you around the world, that, that your time zone is so different than ours, you can watch it after the fact when it's sunset your time, and do it according to the way Jesus did it. Just a few more scriptures. In chapter 45, verse 21, will people be keeping the Passover, which we're getting ready to observe? In the first month and the 14th day, Ezekiel 45, verse 21, you shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. This is during the millennium. If it was done away, why are these nations going to be doing it? Chapter 46, verse 1, the temple will be shut the six working days, Sunday through Friday, but on the Sabbath it will be open. Why? Verse 3, the people of the land shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbath. But the churches today refuse to do it. Verse 9, it talks about uh, the solemn feast there in, verse, in line 3. Solemn feast that people are going to be observing. Now, I won't turn to Isaiah, but if you're taking notes, it's Isaiah 66, verses 18, 19, and 23. It talks about the fact that they're going to see the glory of the Lord when he comes back. He's coming back with flames of fire. And those that are still eating swine's flesh at that time will be consumed, it says. And then verse 23, it says, And it shall come to pass that from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh, that's Italians, Iranians, Germans, Africans, Eskimos, all flesh, Greeks, Egyptians, will worship the Lord from one Sabbath to another. So how was it done away? And then in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, in verse 22, it says, It shall come to pass that you shall divide it, the land, after they come back into the land, all the tribes, not just the Jews now, but all the tribes, by lot for an inheritance, and to the strangers of sojourn among you, and you'll beget children, this is in the millennium, and they shall be to you as born in the country among the children of Israel. The, the Gentiles will be just like an Israelite, and they shall have inheritance with you. The Gentiles will have the same inheritance that the Israelites have. You know why? They've been grafted into the family of Abraham. Now, you don't hear this taught in most churches. I won't turn to Zechariah 14, but in verse 16 it says, All nations shall worship the Lord from year to year, and they'll keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It says, All the families of the earth, every ethnicity, every race, every nation, and then I'm going to conclude here in Romans chapter 7. In verse 19, the Apostle Paul said he didn't always do the right thing. Sometimes he did evil. The good that I would not, I end up doing. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now this man was an apostle. He didn't say I used to do that. I'm doing it, present tense. I still do wrong things, Paul said. Now, what is evil? Well, evil contradicts God's law. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God. Then he adds, after the inward man. In my heart, I love God's law. My flesh doesn't. Now, don't answer this out loud because this is a very personal question. But do you really look forward to the Day of Atonement? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I've been observing it since I was 18 years old. The Day of Atonement is when we fast all day from food and water. And I'll be up front with you, and I'll be honest with you. I don't look forward to it. I do it because it's in God's Word. The flesh. Now, in my heart, I'll look forward to it. I'll look forward to God's holy days. My flesh says, oh, no, not again. And anytime you fast, Jesus said, when you fast, etc. So anytime you're, you're fasting, your flesh doesn't look forward to it. But your heart says, yeah, God has revealed things to me in the Bible when I was fasting, fasting and praying. And I don't have to take time to go fix meals and go eat. I spend that time just praying to God and fasting. And sometimes God will reveal new truths and new understanding to me when I'm fasting. My flesh doesn't like it, but my heart does. Paul said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 25, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. 
If the law of God is abolished, how could he serve it 30 years after the cross? Now, what I'm teaching contradicts what all the churches, all Sunday churches that's out there, I'm contradicting them. But that's not my fault. I'm reading out of the Bible. How many scriptures have I read to you today? A bunch. What scriptures do they have to tell you the law was abolished? Zero. Now, one final scripture. Let me give you the reason why the church world and the, the heathen world and the pagans and the agnostics and the atheists, let me give you one reason why they won't keep God's Passover this year and they won't keep the rest of God's law. One verse, chapter 8 and verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity. That means it's antagonistic against God. Why is the carnal mind enmity against God? For it is not subject to the law of God. If you are not subject to the law, God tells us to put the leavening out of our house at Passover. I ain't going to do that. Well, you're not subject to it because you're carnal-minded. Now, everybody here has a fleshly mind, but you don't have to be carnal-minded. You can have a human fleshly mind and still be spiritually minded. Jesus was a human being with a fleshly brain just like we've got, but he was spiritually minded. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, We have the mind of Christ. Well, if we have the mind of Christ then we have the privilege of being spiritually minded when we want to be. And that ought to be every day. But you can be fleshly minded when you want to be. You can go down here to Trade Street and be fleshly minded, I guess. I've heard rumors. I've never found anybody. I've not gone looking for anybody either. But I mean, when I've driven down Trade Street, I don't know how many times, and I've never seen anybody out there walking the street. But you can be fleshly minded, or you can be spiritually minded. It's like God says, I've set before you life, and death, blessing and cursing, now you choose. And it's up to you. You have a carnal mind. You can punch somebody's lights out when you get mad, or you can turn the other cheek and forgive. It's up to you. We have two minds, the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. The carnal mind is not subject to God's law, neither indeed can be. And that's why the churches are not going to be keeping Passover that's why they're not going to be putting the leavening out of their homes. What about you? What are you going to do? You have a choice to make. And people watching here have a choice to make. Our graduates have a choice. Now, if you don't believe everything I've said, the day will come when you will. Because everything I've said come out of the truth of God. You will believe this one day. You may not like it, but you will believe it. I've chosen to like it. I delight in the law of God. Can you say that? Do I delight in keeping Passover? I gotta get all the living out of my house. I delight in keeping Pentecost. I delight in keeping these holy days. I even delight in not eating unclean meat so I can be healthy. How about you? I delight in being healthy. How about you? I delight not getting the coronavirus. I delight in all the blessings that come from obeying God's law. Any any questions? I'm through. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Romans 8 and verse 7 uh, the carnal mind is enmity against God and that's the reason why they, they can't obey God. It says neither indeed can be. Any other questions? Anybody online that's got a question real quickly? There's about a 15 second delay and right now we've addressed everything. Okay. I'm sorry I kept you just about four minutes over time. We didn't expire did we? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> It'll wither away. Huh? But now, <laughs> but now the next two Sabbaths here, we're going to get we're getting into the nitty gritty of what the New Testament says about Passover. Please be here for the next two Sabbaths, and we'll let you know by then whether we'll be able to have communion here or whether we're going to just live stream or however we're going to do it. As far as graduation is concerned, uh, that we're leaving it up in the air for right now. Legally, right now, we always have over 100 people. We usually have about 250. That's yeah. how many chairs we put out. They're yeah, full. so uh, we probably, right now, legally, we won't be allowed to have a good, uh, graduation. Right. So we'll, and I'm all in favor of just mailing people their diplomas. That's it. all right with me. All right, well, if there's no other questions or comments, thank you all for coming. God bless you. Have a good week. Stay healthy. We'll see you next time. Oh, there is a question. It, it came in after. It says... Um, hold, hold that minute. Okay.
places. Right. Like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, no problem. I don't know why that is. Yeah. Like, still the same link as they always work. I like the live stream that so that you can actually display. That stretch. Yeah. 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 It's the angle. Yeah. 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 The angle. Yeah. 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 You can talk to her? Yeah. Okay, we can talk to her. Well, here, answer this say, question so I can get well. the What's the question? Are you meeting in a group, and is that contrary to the edict of the king? <laughs> Are we meeting in a group, and is that contrary to the edict of the king? Mm -hmm. um, That's right, yeah. When? Meeting in a group when it passed over? I guess it passed over. Well, they didn't hear the well right yeah. now we're meeting in a group, but we have about 11 people here right now. Yeah, right now we are. So it's in, we're in the room. Within 50 people, uh, we're legal. Uh,